My Lords, um, this is the first time I've had the opportunity of speaking in committee on this important bill, but I've followed it very closely. And the spirit in which constructive debate has been conducted has been genuinely exemplary. Uh, and in many ways, it mirrors the manner in which the Joint Committee, uh, on which I had the privilege to serve with other uh, noble Lords, was conducted. And its report has rightly influenced our proceedings in so many ways. Um, I declare an interest as Deputy Chairman of the Telegraph Media Group, which is a member of the News Media Association, a director of the regulatory funding company, and note my other interests as set out in the register. I'm going to avoid the temptation philosophically to ruminate um, uh, um, in the way that the noble uh, lady um, entertained us with, but I want to speak specifically to Amendment 48 in the name of the noble Lord, Lord Stevenson of Balmacara, and the other um, amendments which impact on the definition of recognised news publishers. Uh, as the noble Lord, uh, Lord Stevenson said, uh, his amendments are, are pretty robust in terms of what they seek to achieve, but I am very pleased that he's tabled them because it's important we have a debate about how this bill impacts on freedom of expression, and I'll use that phrase advisedly, uh, and press and media uh, freedom. Um, and his aims are, are, are laudable, but I don't think they quite deliver what he intends. Let me explain why I think it's important that clauses 13 and 14 do stand part of this bill and without uh, um, amendments of the sort proposed, because this is an issue which the Joint Committee did consider in some detail uh, and supported the uh, inclusion of the news publisher content exemption. The reason, in my view, that these clauses are so crucial to the whole architecture of the bill is that they protect news publishers from being dragged into an onerous regime of statutory content control. Uh, the press, and these um, clauses, of course, cover the broadcasters too, uh, have not been subject to any form of statutory regulation since the end of the 17th century. And that is indeed what we understand uh, by press freedom, that the state and its institutions don't have a role in controlling or censoring comment. Clauses 13 and 14 protect that position and ensure that the media, which is of course subject to rigorous independent standard codes as well as the criminal and civil law, does not become part of a system of state regulation by the back door because of its websites and digital products. And that's what's at the heart of these clauses that we're looking at. But it is not a carte blanche exemption without caveats. To qualify for it, um, as we again looked at in the committee, publishers must meet stringent criteria which are set out in clause 50 of the bill, as we've heard, uh, which includes being subject to standard codes, having legal responsibility for material published, having effective policies to handle complaints, and so on. And it's exactly the same tough definition which was set out in the National Security Bill, which noble lords across the House um, supported when it was at report stage here. And without such clear definitions, alongside requirements not to take down or restrict access to trusted news sources without notification, um, opaque algorithms conjured up in Silicon Valley would end up restricting the access of um, UK citizens to news with scant meaningful scope for reinstating it, given the short shelf life of news. And ultimately, that would have a profound impact on the public's right to access news, something the noble lady rightly highlighted. That's why the Joint Committee recommended at, at paragraph 304 that the bill was in fact strengthened, quotes, to include a requirement that news publisher content should not be moderated, restricted or removed unless it is content, the publication of, of which clearly constitutes a criminal offence or which has been found to be unlawful by order of a court within the appropriate jurisdiction. The government listened to that concern that the platforms would put themselves in the position of censor on issues of democratic importance and quite rightly amended the draft bill to deal with uh, that point. Um, without it, instead of trusted, curated, regulated news comment, from the BBC to The Guardian to the um, Manchester Evening News, news would end up being filtered by Google and Facebook. And that would be a crushing blow to free speech, um, to which all noble lords are absolutely committed. 
And so instead of these clauses acting as a bulwark against disinformation by protecting content of democratic importance, they would weaken the position of trusted news providers by introducing too much ambiguity uh, into the system. Um, and as we all know, ambiguity brings with it legal challenge and constant controversy. Uh, this is especially so given that the exemptions that we're talking about already exist in statute elsewhere, which would cause endless confusion. So I understand the rationale behind many of the amendments, but I fear they wouldn't work in practice. Uh, free speech, and again I use the words advisedly, is a very delicate bloom which can easily be swept away by badly drafted, uncertain or opaque laws. Its protection needs certainty which is what the bill as it stands provides. A general catch-all uh, clause would be subject, I fear, to endless argument with the platforms who are well known for such tactics and for endless uh, legal wrangling. Um, I followed the remarks of the noble Lord, Lord Stevenson of Balmacara in his superb speech on the opening day of the committee when he said that one issue with the bill is, it, is that it is very difficult to understand, in part because of its innate complexity and in part because it has been revised so often. And he added in a welcome panegyric to clarity and concision um, uh, that given it is a long and complex bill, why would we add to it? And I agree absolutely with him. But those are arguments for not changing the bill in the way um, uh, he uh, proposes. I believe the existing provisions are clear and precise, practical and carefully calibrated. They don't leave room for doubt and they protect media freedom and investigative journalism and the citizen's right to access authoritative news, which is why I support the bill as it stands. My Lords, uh, given the lateness of the hour, I just want to make three very brief points. Um, the first is that I, I find it really fascinating that the uh, amendments in the name of Baroness Stahl, who, who come from a completely different perspective, but still demand transparency of what is going on. And I fully support the formation that she has found. And I think in many ways they're better than the other ones that came from the other perspective. But I, I think that what I would urge the minister to hear is that we all seek transparency of what's going on. Um, the, the second uh, uh, point I'd like to make is that in the many amendments, I think I counted about 14 or 15 in the name of uh, Lord Moyland and also uh, uh, the noble Lord, uh, Lord Kamal, there is absolutely nothing I, I disagree with. My problem with these amendments really goes back uh, to uh, the debate we had on the first day uh, with Amendment 1 in the name of Lord, uh, the noble Lord Stevenson. And he set out the purposes of the bill. And the noble Lord, the minister, gave what was considered by most members of the Lordship's House to be the groundwork of a very excellent alternative mm. in the language of government. Um, and, and it appears, as we go on, that many dozens of amendments could be dropped in favour of this purposive clause, which itself could include reference to human rights, children's rights, the Equality Act, the importance of freedom of expression under the law, and so on. And, and I do urge the, the noble Lord the Minister to consider the feeling of the House that the things that that are said at the dispatch box are implicit again and again and again. The House requires to be explicit, and this is one way uh, that we could do it uh, in short form, um, as, as, as uh, uh, the noble Lord uh, Black just uh, <laughs> urged us. Uh, and then my third thing is I, I do have to speak against uh, um, uh, uh, the amendment 294, and, and I absolutely, you know, would be happy to take the noble Lord Moyland through dozens of studies that show the psychological impact of, of online harms, you know, systems that 
groom users to gamble, that reward them for being online at any cost to their health and well-being, profile them to offer harmful material, and more of the same whether they ask for it or not. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. I'm also very happy to put some uh, expert voices at his disposal. But may I just say this? The biggest clue to why this amendment is wrong-headed is the number of behavioural psychologists that are employed by the tech sector. They are there trying to get at our behaviours and our thoughts and they anticipate our move and actually try and cre predict and create the next move. That is why we have to have psychological harm in this bill. My Lords, I won't detain you very long either. Um, there are two things that have motivated me to be involved in this bill. One is um, around the protection for vulnerable adults, and the second one is looking at this piece of legislation with my Scottish head on, mm -hmm. because nobody else seems to be looking at it from the perspective of the devolved authority, um, administrations. So, firstly, um, on protection for vulnerable adults, we've already ha had a debate today about um, the fact that in an earlier iteration of this bill there were protections. That's been watered down. We've now got the triple shield. And actually, it seems to me whether they fit here with my noble friend Baroness Stoll's amendments or whether they fit earlier, what we're all asking for is the reinstatement of risk assessments. Yeah. Now, I come at it from a protection of vulnerable groups perspective, but I absolutely recognise that other people come at it from a freedom of, exp of expression pers um, perspective. And I don't think the Minister has answered my earlier question of why are risk assessments, why have they been taken out and why are they any threat to risk assessments? Because it seems to be the will of the debate today that they do nothing but strengthen both the transparency and the safety aspects of the bill wherever they might be put. Now, I speak with trepidation about amendment to Amendment 63 in the name of the noble and learned Lord Hope of Craig Head. Um, I was... Um, flattered, I think, that his amendment and my amendment, I, I flatter myself to say that I think they're trying to do a similar thing. Um, my, I will speak to my amendments when we come to, to the group on, on devolved issues, but I think what both of us are, are trying to find um, is the fact that the bill is relatively quiet on how freedom of expression is defined and therefore how do platforms balance competing rights um, particularly with the, di the, different, the differences in the devolved administrations um, <coughs> the minister will know that you know, the, the Hate Crime and Public Order Act Scotland 2021 has made my brain hurt when I'm trying to work out how this bill affects it or it affects this bill. Um, and, but what, what is definitely clear is that there are differences in the devolved administrations as to how freedom of expression is interpreted. So um, I will study the noble Lord Hope's remarks very carefully in Hansard and you know, I need a little bit of time to, 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 to think about them, and I will listen very carefully to the Minister's response on this, and I look forward to the later groups. My Lords, I will also be very, very brief. Um, I, as a member of the uh, Communications and D Digital Committee, I just wanted to speak in support of my noble friend, uh, Baroness Stoll of Beeston, and I think her extremely powerful speech, which um, seems like it was quite a long time ago now, um, but it wasn't that long. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight two things. Um, as, as, as a number of noble lords have said, I don't understand how having risk assessments is a threat to freedom of expression. I think it's the absolute opposite. Um, I think that it would enhance all the things that the, the noble Baroness Cox is looking to see in the bill, just as much as it would enhance the protections that um, the, the, the noble lady um, it, uh, across, who I always seem to follow in this debate, um, is saying. So, I, I, just as Baroness Fraser has done, I'd like to ask the minister, my noble friend, the minister, why not? Um, when the government announced the removal of legal but harmful, 
um, and the creation of user empowerment tools. I remember, in the midst of being quite busy in COVID, thinking, what are user empowerment tools? And, and what are they going to empower me to be able to do? Without a risk assessment, I don't know how you answer that question, or rather, I don't know how we answer that question. The risk is we are absolutely throwing that ball straight to the tech companies to decide for themselves. So I think a risk assessment provides the framework that will actually enable user um, empowerment tools to do what I think the government intends. And then finally, I too would like to just speak against uh, my noble friend's uh, Amendment 294. And, um, Psychological harm um, is well documented that, that um, tech platforms are designed to drive addiction. Addiction can be physiological and psychological, and we ignore that at our peril. My Lords, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have, uh, have been part of this debate and heard um, uh, how much we are on common ground. Um, and I very much hope that, in particular, the Minister will, be, uh, will have listened to the voices on Conservative benches, which really have very powerfully um, put forward uh, a number of amendments, um, which I think have, have gained general acceptance um, across the House, my Lords. I fully understand the points that Noble Lord Black uh, uh, has made. Um, I, would under uh, I fully understand why he defends uh, Clause 14. Uh, my lords, and I hope, uh, I would hope that we could have a more granular discussion about the contents of Clause 14, rather than wrapping it up in the uh, 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 in this particular group of amendments. And I don't know whether in the next group we will be able to to have that, my lords. Um, but first of all, I want to thank the noble Baroness Stowell for having put forward her amendment. It's very interesting, uh, as uh, noble Baroness Bud and Baroness Fraser have said. It, it, it is where we're trying to get um, the same sort of mechanisms of risk assessment, perhaps out of the different motives, um, but my lords, uh, we're broadly uh, uh, along the same lines and we do want to see them uh, for adult services and we do want to know uh, from the Minister why uh, 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 we can't uh, uh, achieve that, basically, my lords, whether, whether it's on uh, uh, um, uh, user empowerment tools or whether it's on terms of service, I'm sure that we could uh, come to some um, agreement between us about which was the most appropriate way of doing it. Um, on these benches we also support, uh, uh, and uh, I think we need to thank uh, the committee uh, of which uh, Noble Baroness is the chair for having followed up in this way on the letter to the Secretary of State. The, the Secretary of State for DCMS, as was, on the 30th of January. It's good to see a select committee uh, uh, you know, using its, its influence to uh, go forward in this kind of way, my Lords. Um, as regards the amendments tabled by Lord Kamal and supported by my noble friend, Baroness Featherstone, I'm just sorry that she isn't here today, as he said, um, uh, she's not able to be here, but I do think um, that is an important set of amendments. It broadens out the considerations uh, uh, in exactly the right kind of way. But uh, dare I say it, my lords, I think probably the most important uh, amendment in this group is Amendment 48 uh, in the name of the uh, noble Lord um, uh, Stevenson. It's bang on where we were pretty much, uh, apart from that Clause 14 stand part, uh, it's pretty much where the uh, Joint Committee uh, got to. Um, I thought he was remarkably tactful um, about describing uh, or not going into any detail on the government's response, my lords. Um, I'm not going to read it out because of the lateness of the hour, but the noble Lord Colville, I thought, uh, got pretty close uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to really puncturing the government's case on the fact that uh, uh, when they said that there was no proper definition of, publish, uh, of public interest uh, uh, my Lords. It's quite clear that there is a perfectly uh, respectable definition, both in the Human Rights Act 1998 and, as he said, in the Defamation Act 2013, um, which would be quite fit for purpose, my Lords. So I don't quite know why the Government responded at uh, paragraph 251 as they did uh, of their response, uh, and I very much hope the Minister uh, has another look at that, uh, my Lords. 
Um, uh, I thought the noble Lord Pope, um, too, uh, 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 which has the very respectable support of justice, his amendment, uh, 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 was uh, uh, also, I think, entirely um, apposite, and I very much hope that the government will take uh, uh, a good look at that. Um, and then finally, my lords, extraordinarily, I've got quite a lot of sympathy uh, with Lord Moylan's uh, amendments, but uh, uh, it was all going so well until we got to Amendment 294, my lords. Um, uh, but uh, up to that point, I think he had our support um, uh, across the House, uh, 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 because I do think that uh, placing that kind of duty on Ofcom uh, uh, it, it would be a, a positive way forward. But as I say, my Lords, I think getting a clause of the kind that the noble Lord Stevenson has put forward uh, with that uh, uh, pu public interest contest, uh, content point, uh, with, uh, if you like, an umbrella duty on freedom of expression, allied to uh, the noble Lord Hope's definition, I think would really get us somewhere, my Lords. Lawyers, don't you love them? I know we're supposed to unscramble that at this time of night. Um, it was very good to uh, uh, have the learned and uh, noble and learned Lord Hope, my kinsman, back uh, in our debates. We were only remarking a few days ago we didn't see enough lawyers in this part of the, of the, the House. One appears, light appears. It's a marvellous experience. Um, thank you very much to the committee for listening to my earlier introduction of the remarks. I hope it helped uh, un untangle some of the issues that, ca that came back. I think the noble Lord Black um, made it very clear that as far as the press is concerned, they were happy with what's in the, in the current draft. I think there could be some changes. I think we've had a number of examples of ways in which one might either top or tail what there is. But the, I still think, too, there was one question that perhaps he could have come back on. I'm, maybe the noble Lord will do it. I've raised it separately with the department before. A lot of what he said I absolutely agree with, but it applies to a lot more than just news publishers. Quality journalism, more generally, enhances and, ins and restores our, our faith in, in public services in so many ways. Why is it only the news? And, and is there a way we could broaden that? If not in, on this time round, then perhaps something that we need to pick up later. Um, and as the noble Lord Clement Jones says, Viscount Colville made a, a very strong and clear case for trying to think again about what it was that journalism did in the public realm and making sure that this bill at least carried that board if it didn't deal with some of the issues that he raised. And we've had um, a number of other good contributions around how you capture some of the, the good ideas that were flying around in this debate and keep them forward so that the bill is enhanced as we go forward. But I think it's time that the Lord, Lord, Lord Minister gave us his answers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I join uh, the noble lords who have sent uh, good wishes uh, for a speedy recovery to the noble baroness, Lady uh, Featherstone. Uh, amendments uh, 46, 47 and uh, 64 in the name of <coughs> my noble friend, Lady Stirl of Beeston, seek to require platforms to assess the risk of and set terms for content currently set out in Clause 12. Uh, additionally, her amendments seek to place duties on services to assess risks to freedom of expression resulting from user empowerment tools. Uh, Category 1 platforms are already required to assess the impact on free uh, expression of their safety policies, including the user empowerment tools, to keep this assessment up to date, to publish it, and to demonstrate the positive steps they've taken in response to the impact assessment in a publicly available statement. Um, amendments 48 and 100, in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord Stevenson, uh, seek to introduce a standalone duty on Category 1 services to protect freedom of expression with an accompanying code of practice. Amendments 49, 50, 53A, 61 and 156, in the name of the Noble Baroness Lady Fox, seek to amend the Bill's Clause 17 and Clause 18 duties and clarify duties on content of democratic importance. Um, all in-scope services must already consider and implement safeguards for freedom of expression when fulfilling uh, their duties. Category 1 services will need to be clear what content is uh, acceptable on their services, how they will treat it, including when removing or restricting access to it, uh, and that they will enforce the rules consistently. 
in setting these terms of service, they must adopt clear policies designed to protect journalistic and democratic content. This will ensure that the most important types of content benefit from additional protections while also guarding against arbitrary removal of any content. Um, users will be able to access effective appeal mechanisms if content is unfairly removed. This marks a considerable improvement on the status quo. Requiring all user-to-user -user services to justify why they're removing or restricting each individual piece of content, as Amendment 53A would do, would be disproportionately burdensome on companies, particularly small and medium-sized ones, as well as duplicating some of the provisions I've out or, or, or previously outlined. Uh, separately, as private entities, service providers have their own freedom of expression rights. This means that platforms are free to decide what content should and should not be on their website within the bounds of the law. The bill should not mandate providers to carry or to remove certain types of speech or content. Accordingly, uh, we do not think it would be appropriate to require providers to ensure uh, that free speech is not infringed, as suggested in, in Amendment 48. Similarly, it wouldn't be appropriate to require providers to give the same weight to protecting freedom of expression as to safety as required under Amendment 61. Both amendments effectively uh, require platforms to carry uh, legal content even if they did not wish to for safety, commercial or other reasons. Uh, this would likely result in worse outcomes for many uh, users. We've designed the regulatory framework to balance protecting users' safety and protecting users' freedom of expression. Platforms and Ofcom uh, have duties uh, relating to freedom of expression for which they can be held to account. A must-balance test suggests that there is a clear line to be drawn about when, a, when, clear, when legal content should be removed. This is in conflict with our policy, uh, which accepts that it would be inappropriate for the government to require companies to remove legal content accessed by adults. It also recognises that companies as private entities have the right to remove legal content from their services if they wish to do so, preventing them from doing so uh, by requiring them to balance this against other priorities could have uh, unintended uh, consequences. Um, government amendments 50A and 50F, uh, in my name, seek to clarify that the size and capacity of a provider are important in construing the reference to proportionate systems and processes with regard to the duties on Category 1 services to protect content of democratic importance and journalist content. These amendments, which I beg to move, uh, increase legal uh, certainty and make the structure of these clauses consistent with other references to proportionality in the Bill. Without these amendments, it would be less clear which factors are important when construing whether a provider's systems and processes to protect journalistic content and content, content of democratic importance are uh, proportionate. Uh, the Noble Lord, Lord Stevenson of Valmakara's Amendment 51, seeks to change Category 1 services duty to protect journalistic content so that this only applies to journalism uh, which they have judged to be in the public interest. This would delegate an inappropriate amount of power to platforms. Category 1 platforms are not in a position to decide what information is, interest, is in the interests of the British public. Requiring them to do so would undermine why we introduced the Clause 15 duties, namely to... Oh. To ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, why would it be possible for us to try and to define um, what the public interest might be? not leave it to the, to the platforms to do so. For, for us? Yes. Well, I, I, I mean, I'll come, come, come on to, to, to that That's a bit, but, 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 I'm not, but it's not, it's, we don't think it's, it's for uh, Category 1 uh, platforms to do so. Um, we've introduced Clause 15 to reduce the power that the major technology companies have over what journalism is made available to uh, UK users. Uh, accordingly, Clause 15 requires uh, Category 1 providers to set clear terms of service which explain how they take the importance of journalistic content into account when making their moderation uh, decisions. These duties will not stop platforms from removing 
uh, journalistic content. Platforms have the flexibility to set their own uh, journalism policies, but must enforce them consistently and will not be able to treat journalistic content arbitrarily. This will ensure that platforms give all users journalism due process when making content moderation decisions. Amendment 51 would mean that where platforms subjectively reach a decision that journalism is not conducive to the public good, uh, they would not have to give it due process. Uh, platforms could continue to treat important journalistic content arbitrarily where they decide this content is not in the public interests of the UK. Um, the noble Lord uh, Stevenson, in his, in his first um, uh, remarks in this group, engaged uh, with the question of how companies will identify content of uh, democratic importance. Con and content of democratic importance is content uh, which seeks to contribute to democratic political debate in the UK at a national and local level. Uh, it will be broad enough to cover all political debates, including grassroots campaigns and smaller parties. While platforms will have some discretion about what these policies in this area are, they'll need to ensure that platforms are balancing the importance of protecting democratic content with their safety duties. Uh, for example, platforms will need to consider whether the public interest in uh, seeing some types of content outweighs the potential harm it could cause. This will require uh, companies to set out in their terms of service how they will treat different types of content and the systems and processes they have in place to protect such uh, content. Uh, amendments 57 and 62 in the name of my noble friend Lord Kamal seek to impose new duties on companies to protect a broader range of users' rights as well as uh, to pay particular attention to the freedom of expression of users with protected characteristics. As previously set out, services will have duties to safeguard the freedom of expression of all users, regardless of uh, their characteristics. Moreover, uh, UK providers have existing duties under the Equality Act 2010 not to discriminate against people with uh, characteristics which are protected in that Act. Uh, given the range of rights included in Amendment 57, it's not clear what uh, this would require from service providers in practice. Uh, and their relevance to service providers would likely vary between different rights. Uh, amendment 60 in the name of the noble Lord, Lord Clement Jones, and uh, Amendment 88 in the name of the Lord, noble Lord, Lord Stevenson, probe whether references to privacy law in clauses 18 and 28 of the bill include Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, that uh, convention applies to member states which are signatories. Article 8.1 requires signatories to ensure the right to respect for private and family life, home and correspondence, subject to limited derogations, which must, must be in accordance with the law and necessary in a, in a democratic society. Uh, the obligations flowing from Article 8 do not apply to individuals or to private companies, and it would not make sense uh, for these obligations to be applied in this way, given that states which are signatories will need to decide under Article 8.2 uh, which restrictions on the Article 8.1 right they need to impose. It wouldn't be appropriate or possible for private companies uh, to make decisions on such restrictions. Uh, providers will, however, need to comply with all UK statutory and common law provisions relating to privacy and must therefore implement safeguards for user privacy when meeting their safety duties. More broadly, Ofcom is bound by the Human Rights Act 1998 and must therefore uphold Article 8 of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights when implementing uh, the Bill's regime. It's so complicated, you're almost enticing me to stand up and ask about it. Um, so let's just get that right. The, 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 it's, it's, the, the, human, the, the reference to the uh, Article 8 powers exists and applies to those bodies in the UK to whom such and equivalent le legislation applies. So that, that, uh, that ties us into Ofcom. Companies can't be affected by it because it's a public duty, not a private duty. But do I then, am I allowed to walk all around the circle and say, at the end, Ofcom can look back at the companies to establish whether or not, in Ofcom's eyes, its requirements in relation to its obligations to the Convention 8 have or have not taken place. So it's a sort of transparency, um, backward reflecting view rather than a proactive uh, proposition, which seems a complicated way of 
just saying, why don't you behave in accordance with Article 8? Yes, Ofcom, which is bound by it through the Human Rights Act uh, 1998, can ask those questions and make, make that assessment of the companies, but it's wrong. It wouldn't be right for private companies to be bound by something which is... Uh, it's not appropriate for companies to be signatories to. Uh, so Ofcom will be looking at uh, the, these questions, but the, the duty rests on Ofcom bound, as bound by the Human Rights Act. It's late at night and, and it's slightly tedious, but so in the, in the worst of all possible circumstances, you have a situation where Ofcom is looking at what's happened over the last year in relation to its case of practice and assertions about a particular company. Ofcom's in trouble because it hasn't discharged its Article 8 obligations. Who gets, who gets to exercise a whip on whom? Uh, sorry, whips are probably the wrong things to be using, but uh, you see where I'm coming from. Uh, all that's left is for either the Secretary of State, but it probably the, it would be effectively Parliament saying to Ofcom, you failed. It doesn't seem a very satisfactory solution. Pla platforms will be guided by Ofcom in taking measures to comply with their duties which are recommended in Ofcom's codes and which contain safeguards for privacy, including ones based on... Uh, the European Convention on Human uh, Rights and uh, the rights therein. Um, Schedule 4 to the Bill, uh, paragraph 10, subsection 2b, uh, requires Ofcom to ensure that measures which it, it, it describes in a code of practice are designed in light of the importance of protecting the privacy of users. Clause 42, subsection 2 and 3, uh, provide that platforms will be treated as complying with the privacy duties set out at clauses 18, subsection 2b, and clause 28, subsection 2b, if they take the recommended measures that Ofcom sets out in, in the codes. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you. It, it, it worked. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, 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 well, it, it, in seriousness, if... Um, We'll both consult the, the record, and if um, the noble lord wants more, I'm, I'm very happy to set out in uh, in writing. Um, Amendment 63, in the name of the noble and learned uh, Lord Lord Hope of Craighead, seeks to clarify that freedom of expression in clause 18 refers uh, to the freedom to impart ideas, opinions, or information, as referred to in Article 10 of the European Convention on. Uh, human rights, and I think I too have been guilty of using the, the phrases uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression as though they were uh, interchangeable. Um, freedom of expression within the law is intended to encompass all freedom of expression rights arising from UK law, including under common law. Uh, the rights to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights include both the right to impart ideas, opinions and information, but also the right to receive such ideas, opinions and information. Uh, any revised definition of freedom of expression to be included in this bill should refer to both aspects of the Article 10 definition, given the importance for both children and adults of receiving uh, information via the internet. We do recognise the importance of clarity in relation to the duties set out in clauses 18 and 28 and we're very grateful to the noble and learned lord for proposing uh, this amendment and uh, for the uh, experience he brings to bear on behalf of the constitution committee of your lordship's house um, the higher education free speech bill and the online safety bill do serve very different purposes but uh, i'm very happy to say that i and uh, the bill team will consider uh, this amendment uh, closely uh, between now and uh, and report stage. Um, amendments 101, 102, 109, 112, 116, 121, 191 and 220 in the name of a noble friend Lord Moylan seek to require Ofcom to have special regard to the importance of protecting freedom of expression when exercising its enforcement duties and when drafting or amending codes of practice or guidance. Ofcom must already ensure that it protects freedom of expression when overseeing the bill because it's bound by the Human Rights Act, as I say. <coughs> it also has specific duties to ensure that it's clear about how it's protecting freedom of expression when exercising its duties, including when developing codes of practice. 
Uh, my Noble Friends Amendment 294 uh, seeks to remove psychological from the definition of harm uh, in the Bill. It's worth um, being clear that the definition of harm is used in uh, the Bill as part of the illegal and child safety duties. There's no definition of harm, psychological or otherwise, with regard to adults, given the definition of, uh, of content which is harmful to adults uh, was removed from the Bill in another place. With regard uh, to children, I, I agree with the points made by the Noble Baroness Lady Kidron. It is important that psychological harm is captured in the Bill's child safety duties, given the significant impact that such content can have on young minds. Uh, so I would invite my Noble Friend and uh, others to uh, withdraw their amendments in this group. Um, my Lords, um, clearly... Um your Lordships will want me to be brief, bearing in mind the time. So um, I'm very grateful for the support that I've re from, received from the Baroness, my noble friends, uh, Lady Harding and Lady Fraser, and also from the noble Baronesses, uh, Lady uh, Kidron and Bull, for the amendments that I've tabled. And I'm particularly grateful to the noble Baroness, Lady Bull, for the additional detail she added to my description of uh, the amendments. I can always rely on <laughs> the noble Baroness uh, to. Uh, to colour in my rather uh, broad brush approach to these sorts of things. Um, uh, I, um, uh, and I, I'm pleased that the noble Lord, Lord Stevenson, did uh, make his remarks at the beginning of the debate, because I do think that was very helpful in setting out the context uh, that followed. And clearly what we have heard is a basic theme that's come through from your Lordships of uh, a lack of... Um, uh, um, to the certainty that the government has struck the right balance between privacy protection and freedom of expression. And I never stop learning in your Lordship's house, and, and I was very pleased to learn from um, uh, the new uh, Milton, uh, otherwise uh, my noble friend Lord Moylan, uh, that uh, freedom of expression actually is a fundamental right and therefore the balance between that and the other things in this bill is something that does need to be considered in a way I hadn't thought of before. Um, but I think what, um, what is clear, as I say, is um, uh, a lack of confidence from all noble laws irrespective of what direction they are coming from in their contributions to this debate and earlier uh, debates this evening, that uh, either the balance has been properly struck or that some of the clauses that seek to address uh, freedom of speech in uh, this bill are doing so in a way which um, Gives the um, uh, will deliver the outcome and the and the sort of overall purpose of this legislation, as uh, brought forward by um, the government. Um, I would just say a couple of other uh, points, really. That um, uh, back to my noble friend Lord Moylan and his amendments about um, the power of Ofcom in this context, which I thought were particularly okay. interesting. And, um, and I have some sympathy very much from, uh, for what he was uh, arguing. And as I said earlier, the question of power and whether the uh, distribution of it uh, between the various parties involved in this new regime is one we will look at in broad terms, certainly in, uh, in later groups. And, um, uh, and as to um, the, um, the, the, the amendments put forward by the noble Lord, Lord Stevenson around um, those clauses 13, 14 and so on and the um, uh, uh, protections and provisions for uh, news media. I, I tend towards the position of my noble friend uh, Lord Black against uh, what um, the noble Lord, Lord Stevenson has argued. Um, because, as I said at the beginning, I'm concerned about um, censorship by the tech firms of our own um, news organisations. But I also see his argument, and that of the noble, law, uh, the noble Viscount Lord Colville, um, that um, it isn't just our traditional legacy media now that is providing quality journalism. And I do think that is a, uh, an important issue for us to address. But I think what I would say to my noble friend, the Minister, and I'm grateful for his 
uh, uh, roundup and his uh, concluding remarks that whilst it is heartening to hear that he and the bill team will consider the noble and learned Lord Hope's amendment from this group, I do think that what we are looking for in the various different debates we've had over the course of today, for sure, is a little bit more uh, uh, responsiveness and willingness to consider movement um, by the government on various different matters. And I hope that he is able to give us signs of this that are a bit more encouraging as we proceed through committee and before we get to um, sort of further discussions, I hope, with him outside of the chamber and before we get to report. But with that, I will, of course, withdraw my amendments. Yeah. Yeah. Your Lordship's <coughs> pleasure that this amendment be withdrawn. Amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 47, not moved. Amendment 48. Uh, in clause 13, Amendment 49, Baroness Fox, not moved. Amendment 50, not moved. Um, Amendment 50A, Lord Parkinson of Mitley Bay. <clears throat> the question is that this amendment be agreed to. As many as to that opinion will say content. Content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that clause 13, as amended, stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House be resumed. The question is that the House be resumed. As many as are of that opinion will say content. content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. That the House do now adjourn.